Hello and welcome to Through the Bible in 10 Years. And this is my first uh, Through the Bible video from Houghton, New York, uh, where I've taken a, a job at Houghton College. And so we want to do Acts chapter one this week. I've done a kind of introduction to Acts a few weeks ago, and then we had a little hi hiatus while I moved. And now we're ready to dive into Acts chapter one. So let's dive right in with verse one. On the one hand, I made the first word, O Theophilus, uh, concerning all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. Okay, so what was the first word? Well, the first word was the Gospel of Luke. Um, word, of course, is very flexible uh, in Greek and Hebrew, for that matter. So word here doesn't mean a single word like the. It, it's, this is word actually referring to an entire book. Uh, that is the Gospel of Luke. Theophilus is the, uh, the, the recipient of both the book of Luke and Acts. Um, I think probably a real person, um, although Theophilus means lover of God, and so some have suggested it could be to anybody who loves God. It's kind of the, um, the uh, contextual way of reading Acts but probably it was a person. Now, it wasn't just for Theophilus. That wouldn't be the way of these sorts of things. Probably it was written with the intention that many people uh, would, would, would listen in on this conversation. Uh, most excellent Theophilus, he's called, uh, I believe, at the beginning of Acts, which may suggest that he was a person of some importance, perhaps a Roman official, maybe a Roman governor, uh, but in any case, perhaps this, the, the patron who sponsored uh, the, the work of, of Luke Acts. Uh, but anyway, uh, Luke himself, of course, we don't know that the author is Luke. The book Luke Acts never mentions Luke. Um, but the, the uh, author is clearly very educated, just giving the, the level of the Greek and the interaction, I think, implicitly with some secular literature of the day, as we will talk about as we go through it. Um, so... Uh, it's interesting also that he says concerning things that Jesus began to do and to teach seems to be the implication that Jesus continues to do and to teach things uh, through the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Jesus isn't done. Uh, he's still working in the world today. So verse two, until the day that Jesus was taken up, having commanded the apostles through the Holy Spirit, apostles whom he chose, uh, he didn't choose the Holy Spirit. Um, anyway, um, probably should work the, the order there a little bit. To whom also he presented himself living by many proofs after his suffering, having appeared to them over 40 days and speaking things about the kingdom of God. Now, this is interesting because um, none of the other gospels mentions 40 days. And, and what is really fascinating is we don't get the impression that it was 40 days at the end of Luke. That is from Luke, if all we had were Luke 24, you might even get the impression that Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to heaven on the very same day. So this kind of comes out of the blue, uh, this 40-day period here um, uh, in, in the beginning of Acts. Um, but uh, there is this is the most developed statement we have on Jesus' post-resurrection time. We would not have gotten this impression uh, from any of the other Gospels. Verse 4, and having eaten together, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to await the promise of the Father that you heard from me. Now, this is interesting uh, because um, uh, in uh, some of the gospel material, uh, Jesus says, I will, not, uh, I will not drink the cup with you again until I drink in my kingdom, uh, which is interesting. I'm not sure, I'm not sure whether Luke, Luke is trying to say something here. But the impression we get from other Gospels is that he would not eat and drink with them again until he returned in the eschaton. So that's something uh, to ponder, uh, that Luke kind of intention with those other comments uh, has him eating uh, with, with them here. Uh, let me make a quick couple quick fixes before I forget them. There, I want to make sure Father was capitalized. Um, so he tells them to wait for the Holy Spirit, which is, of course, promised. Uh, at the beginning of uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talk about, John says, John the Baptist, I baptize with water, but the one who comes after me will baptize in Holy Spirit, and that's Jesus. And so 
in the story world of Luke Acts, that has not happened yet. So the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that John the Baptist foretold in Luke Acts, it has not happened yet. Now, of course, the Gospel of John has this vignette in chapter 20 where Jesus breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And so there have been those who've tried to kind of sync those two together and see the receiving of the Holy Spirit in John 20 as the first uh, receiving of the Holy Spirit, so that then Acts 2 could be the second receiving of the Holy Spirit. That The difficulty with that interpretation is, is that it is a mixing of two different ways of telling the story. In the Luke-Acts way of telling the story, it hasn't happened yet. And of course, you might argue that John 20 is, is alluding to Pentecost, that he is, this is the Johannine version of Pentecost. He doesn't go into detail. He doesn't talk about it, but it's an allusion, as it were, uh, to it. And so, again, if you want to, to be faithful exegetically to Acts, you have to interpret Acts in ter terms of Luke Acts, not in terms of John. So if we, list, if we're, if we really want to listen to the text rather than kind of impose our schema, our, our outside schema on um, the book of Acts. So he tells him to wait. John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit after not many days uh, forward. So there we have the prologue. Now we, we have the ascension. Um, again, there is an ascension uh, at the end of Luke, in Luke 24. There is no ascension mentioned in Matthew, Mark, or John. Um, sometimes people confuse uh, the Great Commission in Matthew 28 with the ascension. But of course, Matthew 28 is in Galilee, and in, in Luke, uh, in Acts here, and in Luke 24, we're in Jerusalem. So the, the Great Commission is not, does not take place uh, at the same time as the ascension. Uh, at least not um, uh, those two worlds don't, don't meet in that sense. So verse six, therefore having come together, they were with him, the disciples were asking him saying, Lord, are you going to now restore the kingdom to Israel? Now on the one hand, uh, I, our first impression is to say, are they really that dumb? Don't you know that God, that um, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world? But actually, if we look at this carefully, uh, Jesus in Acts here does not treat them as dumb. His answer is, you stupid people, don't you know? It's all about going to heaven. That's not what Jesus says. He says in verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has appointed by his own authority. His answer is, it's, it's a not yet not a, you're, you're silly. And so, um, and again, I don't, this could play into, you know, kind of simple dispensationalist interpretations of 1948 being the restoration of Israel and so forth. Um, I, I resist that sort of, of easy correlation. Uh, we, we have yet to see uh, whether the current kingdom of Israel is the uh, kingdom of promise. They're not Christian, right? Israel's not Christian. And so this has not happened yet uh, in, in the sense of Paul in Romans 11. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see what happens, what happens there. But let me go back to the first century. And, and they ask him, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Are you going to kick the Romans out of Dodge now? But that's not, that's not on the agenda uh, for this particular point uh, in history. And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times of the season that the father appointed by his own authority. That's not the business of the day. That's not what we're about uh, now. Um, and of course, we know all of the disciples died without having seen the kingdom be restored to Israel. Um, and so verse seven, he said to them, it is not for you to know, but verse eight, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And this is a little bit like an, an outline of the book of Acts, because the first seven chapters of Acts are in Jerusalem, and then chapters 8 through 12 of Acts are in Judea and Samaria, and then chapters 13 to 28 of Acts are to the ends of the earth. And of course, Rome would have been the ends of the earth in the way that their paradigm, in the way that their worldview understood uh, the world. And so I, I've long thought of uh, Acts 1-8 as the key verse 
of the book of Acts, as a general statement that plays itself out in the rest of the book of Acts, although there are other ways of, of outlining the book of Acts. Okay, but they're going to receive power. And, and the book of Acts does seem to indicate that power, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the emphases of the book of Acts, power is the primary manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Verse 9, and having said these things while they were watching, Jesus was taken up and a cloud received him from their eyes. Now, of course, this ascension has to be more for their good than for real, you know, uh, ontological good. What I mean is, is that heaven isn't straight up, right? Um, uh, for one thing, the earth is a rotating globe. And so going up at any one point takes you to a different kind of direction. They, of course, thought of, of a very static universe. In their, in their way of thinking, you have a relatively flat earth, and then you go up through layers of sky vertically until you get to the highest heaven where God's throne room is. Well, of course, we have a more developed sense of the universe, um, and I, I personally have not, have not always thought of heaven as being in this universe even, because if God created the universe out of nothing, then wherever God is, it must not be here. It must not be in this universe. It must be somewhere else, right? I've always thought of heaven as being in another dimension, uh, for example. Not always, but for a long time. So uh, the, 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 leave, the going up through the clouds would seem to be more for the disciples' benefit you know, for, for, than for a re reality reason. You know, it's kind of he, Jesus goes up, 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 up. He clears the cloud and cut. And then he goes to whatever other dimension heaven is in or other universe that heaven is in or, or our mind explodes because we have no idea. I have written a novel, by the way, um, Gabriel's um, uh, uh, diary, uh, The Creation, uh, that uh, uh, is quite um, weird. Okay, um, but let's, let's, let's go on here. So verse 10, while they were looking intently into the sky, him going, behold, two men appeared to them in white clothing. And of course, we think of these as angels rather than men. Verse 11, although it does raise the interesting question as to whether, well, I think, I think probably we could argue that Jews at the time of Jesus uh, thought of angels as male. Um, all, the, all the angels who are mentioned in the Bible have male names. There were probably, I mean, I mean, we, I mean there were. There were Jews who believed that angels had male genitalia. There, I mean, we, we know that there were Jews who used to think this. Um, I, I don't be troubled, uh, because uh, in, in my mind, uh, this is the incarnation principle. God reveals truth to us uh, in our categories, and, and our, our categories are like the, the envelope in which the message comes. And so, you know, thinking of, of them as men um, is the way that they thought of them. Uh, I assume that angels are not uh, gendered or sexual beings um, in the way that we humans are. I just don't think they are. Um, but um, let's move on. Um, so the, the, the two angels said, men, Galileans, why are you standing here looking into the sky? This Jesus, the one who's been taken up from you, will come again in the way you have beheld him going. Now, of course, it's been 2,000 years, and Jesus, Jesus hasn't yet returned. But we believe as Christians that Jesus will return. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. That'll be the second phase. First, The first phase, Jesus was more of a pacifist, it would seem. But in phase two, he's going to crack some eggs. Well, okay, let's move on. Matthias. So they returned to Jerusalem from the mount that is called Olives, which is near Jerusalem, about a Sabbath's journey. Not very far, really, at all. I think that a Sabbath's journey was, what, a uh, thousand cubits, something like that. Um, it, it's not really that far at all um, to the Mount of Olives from, uh, from the Eastern Gate. So um, they returned, um, and when they entered into the upper room, I think this is probably the same upper room where um, uh, the, the Last Supper was had, maybe at the house of Mary, maybe at the house of Mark's mother uh, in Jerusalem. We just really don't know. When they entered the upper room, they went up where they were staying, and Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas 
um, uh, son of James. They were all devoting themselves intently to prayer with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Well, okay. So we have, we have the, the same core of disciples, of course, minus Judas. They're praying. We, we see some of the characteristic themes of Luke. They're, they're the special themes of Luke. They're also the special themes of Acts. One of the uh, emphases of Luke Acts is prayer. A lot of prayer going on. And we see here that after Jesus ascends, the uh, now apostles, they were disciples. They were apprentices. They were learners. They were followers of Jesus. Now they have become the sent ones. Now they have become the apostles. Now they have become witnesses to the resurrection. And they're devoting themselves to prayer. Another special theme of Luke Acts is the emphasis on women, um, and especially uh, on, on a, a whole lot of people who were on the margins or who are sometimes oppressed or who are disadvantaged, the disenfranchised, the, so the marginalized of that society, and, and the emphasis on women will continue. There weren't just male followers of Jesus, there were female followers of Jesus. So this would include people like Mary Magdalene, and of course, Mary the mother of Jesus is there. And it looks like Jesus' brothers have finally got on board with the program. Uh, people like James and Jude and Joseph um, are apparently now uh, supporting uh, the idea that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, and so they are there, there in Jerusalem as well. Now, verse 15, in these days, having risen in the middle of the brothers and sisters, Peter said, and the crowd uh, of people was about 120. So this is a fairly sizable group of people. Who are all the people? Well, they're not only they're, they're fo Jesus followers from Galilee, but now I assume that there is a fairly large, or well, I mean, 120, there is a, a growing number of people in Jerusalem uh, who have heard of these events and have come to believe in Jesus, uh, and they, the, the, the group is growing. Um, and so um, the, Peter rises up and said, Peter is the one, the, the first man to whom Jesus appeared. Now we know that, that from the Gospel of John that Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene uh, before any other man. So a woman was the first apostle. A woman was the first one to whom Jesus appeared and the first one that Jesus uh, commissioned to go and tell the message of his resurrection. But Peter was the first male and it was a male oriented uh, culture. Um, and as we will find, we will find in the book of Acts that Peter didn't quite get um, the, the um, egalitarianism of, of the age of the spirit. He had, I mean, Peter had trouble with recognizing that Gentiles uh, were co-equal, and perhaps they had difficulty understanding that women were co-equal as well. A book of Acts will push those barriers, those cultural uh, limits. But Peter gets up and he says, verse 16, men, brothers, and sisters, it was necessary for the scripture to be fulfilled that the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand through the mouth of David concerning Judas, the one who became leader of those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us, and he obtained a lot in this ministry. So Peter is highlighting the fact uh, that um, Scripture can be read through spiritual glasses uh, in relation to Judas um, that, that, that resonate. So the, their Scriptures in the Old Testament resonate with what Judas did, and, and you kind of see that, that this fits the overarching narrative of Scripture. But now we have a parenthetical uh, comment in verses 18 and 19, that this is now where uh, Luke, let's call the author of, Luke, of Acts Luke, uh, kind of turns to the side to the audience, to Theophilus, and he says, therefore, this one, Judas, on the one hand, he bought a field from the reward of his unrighteousness, and he, he, he fell head first, his middle burst open, his bowels gushed out. Verse 19, and it became known to all those who lived in Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own dialect a keldama, that is, field of blood. And the, the, um, um, the dialect here is, I mean, is the, the, the language is Aramaic, of course, a keldama, field of blood. Now, there's a little bit of a difference between uh, what Acts says here about Judas and what we hear, for example, in Matthew. So in Judas, um, 
He tries to take the money back. Um, they won't take it. He throws it on the ground and he goes out and he hangs himself. So one of the long standing is question, question is how do we how do we um, fit together Jesus hang or Judas hanging himself in Matthew and Judas falling headfirst in uh, Acts? And some have come up with really ingenious um, uh, harmonizations like you know he he hung himself, the rope broke, he fell off the cliff, he 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 burst open, um, but. Um, I don't think that it's necessary for us to try to harmonize uh, these accounts because the, I mean, the gospels, I don't think uh, were written with the intention of doing that, so, that sort of uh, thing. And often when we try to do it, we create a fifth gospel that's none of the four. I just don't think that that, um, uh, that kind of harmonization is very, is very helpful. Uh, and it's not something we should worry about um, either. But in any case, um, uh, uh, it's also agreed, uh, it's, it, it is clear that there was a field associated with the death of Judas that was called a keldama. And, and so that this is a kind of an aside uh, from Luke to Theophilus. Then Acts, um, Peter's sermon continues, and he quotes some scripture. Now, something that, that uh, I would argue, and I frankly don't see that there's any debate here, I'll just be clear. Um, that the New Testament authors read the Old Testament spiritually, that they, they paid varying amounts of, con of attention to the context uh, in which the passages they were quoting um, uh, various, various amounts. And so um, this should not be, a, it's not a problem. I'm, I'm telling you, it's not a problem. It's only a problem if someone mistakenly sets you up for failure and says, no, 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 these are exactly what the psalmist meant. Um, it's, it's more, uh, it's deeper than that, and it's more spiritual than that. Uh, and so uh, uh, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that and, and, and dig it into it here. So there, there are two Psalms that the Holy Spirit um, brings alive to Peter here um, and, and quickens them, makes it come alive. One is from Psalm 69, let his house be deserted and do not let anyone dwell in it. Now, um, again, the way I grew up, I might have thought, oh, if you go back to Psalm 69, you're going to find a prediction. There will be an evil man who betrays the Messiah. Uh, and once he has betrayed him, let his house be deserted and don't let anyone dwell in it. And the second quote is, let another take his apostleship, let, an, let another take his office, let another, another take his role of oversight. This is a quote from I think Psalm 139. So you, you might have expected to go back to these Psalms and find a straightforward prediction, but that's not how it works. These are resonances. These are uh, two different strings that are resonating at the same frequency. This is a, a fuller sense, a spiritual sense. And so when we go back to Psalm um, 69, for example, let his house be deserted. This is actually a Psalm that the early Christians uh, found a lot of things in this psalm uh, that resonated with the final days of Jesus. Now, did God intend that? Well, God knew it, so yes. So I'm not in any way suggesting that, that uh, wow, this is wrong. No, that's not the point. My point is that there, there is a kind of double meaning that Psalm 69 uh, can have. There was the original meaning, which is the meaning that the psalmist thought. This is a psalm pleading for God, save me. The waters have come up to my neck. I'm sinking. I have no foothold. I'm in deep waters. I'm weary. Okay, so this psalm could be read by lots of people. I could read it if I were in distress. You could read it. The psalmist can read it, and the psalmist intended it when the psalmist was in uh, distress. What I'm getting at is um, the early Christians read this in relation to Jesus, and Jesus may have read it in relation to himself as well. But it doesn't have just that one application. The psalm is not just about Jesus. Uh, uh, God, God designed it to have more resonances uh, than that. So verse nine, zeal for your house has consumed me. Uh, the early Christians heard a resonance between that verse and Jesus over, overthrowing the tables of the money changers in, in the temple. Um, uh, there's a lot of stuff here that the Christians didn't 
necessarily relate to, to Jesus. Um, um, let their table be a trap for them. Uh, let, uh, my, talking about the psalmist enemies, they persecute those. I'm lowly, I'll praise the name, I'll magnify him. Let the oppressed see it. The Lord hears the needy. All of, all of these um, uh, are really uh, uh, prayers that could apply uh, to all sorts of people. Um, now you can see I even read past uh, the verse uh, that that is is quoted here, um, because it's it's not just about Jesus. The psalm wasn't just or even to even think of it as a prediction of Jesus. It's more okay, at verse twenty one. They gave me vinegar uh, to drink. There's a resonance with that with Jesus on on the on the cross. Okay, here it is, verse twenty five. May their camp be a desolation and let no one live in their tents. So in the psalm, this is more, the psalmist had specific people in mind, but the Jews who read this psalm for, you know, the, the next hundreds and hundreds of years understood it generically. And then here, um, uh, basically, um, uh, Acts understands it very specifically. Acts understands it very specifically in relation to Judas. That's not the way it was. It wasn't just about Judas, um, but he un, he reads it in a spiritual sense to be about uh, Judas. Okay, so the second one, let another take his role of oversight, which almost sounds like it's in tension with the first one. The first one says, don't let anybody dwell in his house, but that's talking about his house. And then the second one is talking about his office. Let another take his role of oversight. Basically, um, uh, Peter understands this to be about, or Luke understands Peter to, for this to be about uh, replacing Judas as one of, of the 12. Now, this particular psalm uh, is quoting Psalm uh, 109, sorry, one, Psalm 109. And Psalm 109 is, again, very generic. Um, the psalmist talks about his enemies um, and uh the psalmist is saying, let the days of my enemy be few, um, and then may another take his position. So the original psalm in Psalm 109 is very generic. It wasn't just specifically about uh, Judas, but Peter, or Luke, uh, here's Peter having a, um, a resonance of, uh, of that psalm with Judas, and, and the Spirit says to Peter, you need to replace Judas. And so verse 21, we begin to have the replacement of, of Judas. And so, therefore, it is necessary uh, for one of the men who have gathered together with us from the whole time that the Lord Jesus came in and went out from us, having begun with the baptism of Judas until the day that Jesus was taken from us, we need one of these men uh, to become a witness with us of, a, of the resurrection. By the way, I, I, I think it would have been perfectly fine uh, for it to be a woman but this was a male-oriented culture. God meets people where they're at, and so, you know, they appoint they appointed a woman. Of course, we never hear about this guy again. There have been some who thought, well, maybe Paul should have been the, the 12th apostle. Maybe, maybe Paul should have been the replacement. But it's interesting, Paul doesn't qualify according to the, the criteria they give here, because the, one of the replacement has to be someone in their mind who had been there from the very beginning. Uh, that, who had been there from the time of the baptism. And so, you know, we have to decide, is this, is this description or prescription? It's telling us what happened. Did they get it right? Now, of course, I haven't, I'm not in any way claiming that they didn't get it right. I'm sure Matthias was a great apostle. But of course, God uses more than just the 12 uh, apostles that were kind of the official uh, apostles, uh, the big apostles, as it were, the capital 12 um, apostles. But um, they understand that the replacement needs to be someone who'd been there from the very beginning, so Paul would not have qualified. So they, they came down to two, a guy named Joseph called Barsabbas, uh, who's called Justice. Boy, he's got a lot of names, doesn't he? Uh, maybe he's a Roman citizen, so had lots of names. And Matthias. <laughs> they tell us more about the name about the guy that isn't chosen than they tell me about the guy that was chosen. Verse 24, after they prayed, again, emphasis on prayer, uh, as an uh, emphasis in Luke Acts. And they said, Lord, you are a knower of all hearts. Show us the one, um, the one whom you have chosen uh, from these two 
to take the place of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned away to go to his own place. And they cast lots. The lot fell upon Matthias, and he was included with the 11 apostles. Now, uh, I don't recommend that we start casting lots. Um, now, I don't know anybody who's, who's applied this one. Uh, there are those who said, ah, the 12 apostles are male, therefore we have to appoint male preachers. Uh, but I don't know anybody who says, ah, they cast lots to decide who should be the leader. Therefore, we should cast lots to decide who's going to be the leader. It just, it's just a reminder that uh, people are often inconsistent um, in their literalism, so to speak. Uh, that even those who say, no, no, we've got to literally do it, everything, everything the way. This is, we have to do it exactly the way they did it. I don't know very many people who, who, who throw dice, uh, you know, for example, to decide who the pastor should be or who the, the general superintendent uh, should be and so forth. Um, it was a culturally appropriate way uh, for that time of, of making the decision. And I, I, I certainly want to believe uh, that God stooped to their culture as he stoops to ours and met them uh, within the understanding uh, that they had. Uh, well, there you have it. A Acts chapter one, and we've begun our journey through the book of Acts in our 10 years through the Bible series. Lord willing, we will see you next week with Acts chapter two.